um, is it's this guy um, who is trying to work up the nerve to walk into a party and propose marriage to a woman. And then he decides against it that, no, I'm not good enough, she'll say no, and he goes and takes a walk on the beach and is sad. Oh, <laughs> that is sad. Yeah. I mean, there, 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 there's a particular, like, there, there's a couplet in the poem. It's like, I've heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. And like, it's just like, it's just heartbreaking. You know? yeah. <laughs> that one, when I was reading that part, I was like, this is so degrading. You know, it's so bald. Yeah. 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 Well, and I, I think that there's a lot of anxiety over aging yeah. as well, and, you know, yeah, in that particular poem. But that's not the poem we're actually going to talk about right. today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, there are a couple of things I want to pass out to you. Uh, so, first is our usual uh, bibliography. So if you want more information about T.S. Eliot than I can give you, these are the places you can go. And I'm also going to give you a sample annotated bibliography to give you a template to follow when you have to do this for your paper. Because you know this is, you know this this is coming up. Um, you should be thinking at least about texts that you want to write your paper about, and maybe starting to um, arrange some, to, starting to order sources. Um, and again, like if you need help with any of this, just you know, you know, everybody knows where my office is. You are free to come talk to me at any time, so long as I am actually there. <laughs> okay. So does anybody have any questions about stuff that's coming up? That be new. You said we need to have a sources for the second paper? Eight secondary sources? Oh, sources? no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, I said you need to have five. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, eight? I'm sorry, I thought it was eight. I don't know where I got eight. No, eight, 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 eight is a lot. Eight, eight, is, eight is too many for, um, for, for a, a relatively brief research paper. Yeah, no, I, I mean, like, eight would be almost a source of page. That's, you don't want that many. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, five. Five sources. <laughs> I was like, wait, did that, I not get enough? That, that, that will be sufficient. <laughs> oh, goodness. Does anybody else have any questions about the paper or the NC bibliography or anything else or the exam, whatever? Um, so I will, next week, um, I'll give you um, a set of sample uh, essay questions. For the exam, so that you know, over the break, you can start thinking about that as well and working with those. Okay. All right. So, the wasteland. So the the basic um, gist I was getting from the conversation before class is that um, this was hard. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, we noted some of the things that were hard about it. Like one, um, he slips into other languages at frequent enough, pretty frequently, right? Some of this is in Latin, some of it's in ancient Greek, some of it's in French, some of it's in Italian, some of it's in German. What other things did you find particularly difficult about this? The constant references, so like so many things. Like I was uh -huh. constantly reading the footnotes, but okay. This is the reference of this. this okay. This going back, back and forth. So, ha like, so having to check the constant references got distracting? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'll lose my place. Okay. I'll start all the way over. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. And I, one thing that we do need to note, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about this in a minute, is that those references are actually supposed to be adding up to a kind of whole idea. And I think that, you know, maybe we, we, we can do some work to figure out what that whole idea is. But what were you going to say, Kelly? Oh, I think too, like it kept breaking it down into other random sections. So like there's the burial of the dead, the, uh -huh. the game of chess, and the fire sermon. And I just didn't see how any of those connected. Like I could barely connect the stanzas uh -huh. within each section, let alone like the, okay. the giant sections there, with it too. <laughs> there is actually a logic to the way each of the sections are connected. Okay. So... <clears throat> Let's actually start with that, and then we're going to move to an exercise that I think might help us understand what was getting Ryland, what was getting Ryland confused. Um, okay, so the sections, right? So 
we've got five sections, right? The burial of the dead, a game of chess, sermon, death by water, and the fifth, what the thunder said. Now if we take out, if we drop the fifth section here, just look at the first four. In fact, even just look at one, three, and four. Do we notice something that maybe they have in common with each other? Death. <laughs> maybe if we just isolate three and four, what do the titles reference? Each one of these first four sections is built around one of the four classical elements, right? So burial of the dead is earth. A game of, ch a game of chess, which is primarily about speech um, and overheard voices and conversations, is air. The fire sermon and death by water are obvious. And then what the thunder said gives us kind of a synthesis, right? But yeah, each of those first four sections is built um, around the idea of one of the four classical elements. So we'll, we'll kind of get to what that looks like in a little while. But first, I want to try a little exercise that I think might help us understand how the poem is put together and what's going on what exactly Eliot is doing. So what I've got here are little snippets of song lyrics, quotes from TV shows and movies, quotes from poems, quotes from plays, quotes from novels. And what I would like you to try to do is Cobble some of these together into a poem of your own. Right? Just take little bits from some of these and try to make them into a poem. And you know, you can provide you know, little connective lines if you feel like you need to, but most of what you're writing should come from these quotations. There are two sides to it, just in case.
think about what you want to say and which lines from this might suit this and how you might stick them together. Did I, just maybe, did I just maybe choose an unusually dark uh, <laughs> set of quotations here? I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any connections. <laughs> so maybe what you want to do to first is try to like pick a mood or an idea okay. that you want to convey, and then see how you can use some of this stuff to uh, convey that. Start there. Okay.
art background might actually be giving you an advantage. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about what why that is when we talk about what this is. I get like I understand the poem now better. Like I'm like oh I see what we're doing. <laughs> Is there like a specific structure of poetry we're trying to use? <laughs> like, no. No random. Oh, no. <laughs> well, that's a, the, the, the thing is, it, it's actually not random, right? These aren't random selections, but. Art is never random. <laughs> you throw paint on a mm -hmm. wall, it's like, yeah, that was purposeful. <laughs> I did that on purpose. <laughs> that's me in all my art classes. <laughs> <laughs> How, how are we? How are we all faring so far? Um, so you're, 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 you're done. done. What's that? I, I finished the first dance. I'm like giving the last, like final line for the second stanza. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Take a couple more minutes. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> and remember, everybody, no pressure. This is just this is just an exercise. It doesn't have to be genius. I can't write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I can write it kind of, but I don't understand it very well. <laughs> We stop here and share what we've got. It doesn't have to be very long or very good. <laughs> so who is who's who's willing to go first? I'll go first. Right. Okay, um, okay, go ahead. So I titled my loneliness, um, <laughs> and it is like a creeping vine on a tall tree, crawl upward where I cannot stand alone. It is the nature of my game. Chaos was its name. If your lifeguard skills were as good as your singing, a lot of people would be drowning. What's cooler than being cool? Ice cold. And you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. Short of breath, one day closer to death. Hell is just a frame of mind. Your family and I love you, but you're all terrible. You're all terrible. <laughs> Cut this life off from me. Crucifixion? Or no, freedom, actually. <laughs> So you know, it's really it's about lonely, but it actually ends on a weirdly hopeful note there. Yeah. It actually kind of took that that weird little joke from a, the life of Brian and it did something with it. Okay, cool. All right, good. All right, who wants to go next? I do. All right. Um, I don't really have a title, 
But um, it says, <laughs> pleased to meet you. What would you have me do? Make my knees callous, cultivate a supple spine, for hell is just a frame of mind. Before the seas and lands were created, chaos was its name. Tied to machines that make me be, racing around to come up behind you again, for hell is just a frame of mind. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. What, 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 is, what did you end up with, Kelly? I know you've been um, struggling a little bit with I have two lines and no title, and it's not even a complete thought. So, um, okay. Um, I said, a lot of people will be drowning, Mr. Cheeky said, if they're lifeguard skills or something. And I never got to the end of anything, and I'm horrible at poetry. I don't know structure. Let's be fair, I also only gave you 15 minutes for this, right? <laughs> You know, a, a, a bunch of quotes that you know you may not have been familiar with. Um, the difference is, you know, T.S. Eliot sitting in his study has as much time to do this as he wants, <laughs> and is drawing on stuff that is intimately familiar to him. Right? It's all stuff that, like, you know, El Eliot is a highly educated polyglot poet. Um, you know, he had a he finished all the work to complete a PhD in philosophy at Harvard, but never defended his dissertation. Um, so, you know, never was awarded the degree. But anyway, like, this is a guy who is high, extremely well read and highly educated. Um, and he's drawing on stuff from high culture and from popular culture, right? So, in addition to all of the Renaissance plays and Greek and Roman novels, and you know Italian medieval poetry that he's quoting here. He's also quoting from like jazz songs and music hall tunes, right? So he's quoting from the pop culture of his day as well. So what essentially is this poem? What do we know this poem is? And what kind of art is this? Now that we've tried this little exercise, what do we understand about it? About what he's put together here? What is it? It's almost like a collage of other works. Exactly, it's a collage. And, a, and collage is really one of the key art forms of the early 20th century. Right, so what is a collage? When you make a collage, what are you doing? It's like cutting snippets of other pieces and making a new art form. Exactly, yeah. It's something new that you make out of fragments of other things that already exist, right? And this is born out of a set of very specific historical anxieties in the early 1920s, right? So for one thing, like, what is just in the rearview mirror in 1922? What massive world-shattering event? Yes. The wasteland is a depiction of that post-war world, right? You know, where you know these old empires um, basically exhaust themselves um, in war. You know, you've got you know millions dead across the globe. Um, you know. <clears throat> Fertile farmland destroyed, cut up by trenches, or you know, rolled over by uh, cannons. And so, there's this sense in the early 20th century um, that European civilization in particular has kind of exhausted. And Eliot is one of the key voices in a broader movement called modernism. Now, how many of you know anything about modernism? In, have any of you heard this term in other, this word in other contexts? Yes, but I don't really remember specifically. <laughs> okay, 
yeah, I, I was thinking that you probably would have had some stuff about this in our history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, um, I'm going to talk about some stuff in a minute that might ring some bells with you. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so we're talking about modernism. We're talking about art um, that is kind of fixated on a sense of newness. Right? One of the mantras of modernist artists was make it new, right? Now often the things that they're trying to make new um, are things that are in fact old, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to reinvigorate old traditions uh, by injecting them with something new, with something different. Um, in fact, I think like probably the key, the key line in the wasteland is on the very last page of the poem. The, the key to everything Eliot is trying to uh, do in this poem is on page 673 in that last stanza. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. Right. Putting together this collage that combines European and South Asian cultural traditions in order to protect against a kind of personal dissolution, right? And I think that, at least from Eliot's standpoint, the newness here comes not just in the form, but also in the fact that he's adding this uh, influence from the Indian subcontinent, or from Indian philosophy. Um, <clears throat> one of the modernist ideas is that a way you can make European culture new again is to inject it with energy from someplace else, whether it's you know from African art or Indian philosophy or that sort of thing. So there is often a kind of appropriation sort of mindset there, um, but yeah, this is what that's this is what they're aiming to do. Um, modernist work also tends to be focused, like the like the work of the Romantics on subjective experience rather than the outer world, right? So the Victorians, will remember, tended to be focused kind of on things outside of the self, on society more broadly, typically. The modernists kind of go back to what a lot of the romantics were doing and are much more concerned with exploring the inner life um, and, you know, the, you know, the human psyche and all that sort of thing. So this all kind of, like, corresponds with um, you know, the rise of psychology, for example, um, as a science. It's kind of happening around the same time. Freud is making his, is publishing his first works um, around the end of the 19th century. Um, another thing that marks modernism is self-conscious difficulty. So if you had gone up to T.S. Eliot and told him, you're like, hey, Mr. Eliot, I really liked your poem, but I'm not sure I understood it, his response to you would be, well, good, you weren't supposed to. There is a kind of snobbery <laughs> about a lot of modernism. On the whole, what we've got are highly educated, extremely cultivated men and women speaking to other highly educated, extremely cultivated men and women, right? Eliot expects that someone who is reading this poem can also read Latin and Greek, right? Can also read a number of modern European languages. This is what's normal to him. <laughs> so yeah, there is a kind of inherent snobbery in um, and <clears throat> I think another thing that we find in a lot of it is a sense of crisis. Whether it's, um, you know, a personal crisis of faith or identity, um, or a kind of worldwide kind of questioning of the way things are. 
And Eliot in particular, I think, is affected by two earlier movements in continental Europe. So the first is called Futurism. which arose mostly in Italy. And the futurists were obsessed with machines and with war. So futurist art tends to celebrate movement action, especially mechanized action. In fact, like a lot of futurist paintings, well, one, they're typically of machines, often doing something violent. And two, right, you will tend, like, they, they, they try to provide the illusion of actual motion, right? So for example, there is a futurist painting of a guy walking his dog. And it's, it shows like kind of like the motion of the dog's legs and the dog's tail, you know, like, in various states of wagging, right? There are futurist pictures of soldiers marching where you can kind of like see like kind of the, the movement of the feet and, and that sort of thing. So to give you a, an example of what futurist paintings typically look like. Here's one of an airplane dive bombing the enemy city. particular movement uh, was a guy who called himself, uh, was a guy named F uh, Filippo Tommaso Martin, uh, Marinetti. This is not one of his paintings. Marinetti is actually a poet, not a, uh, a painter. But even the poetry of futurism tends to be like mechanistic, right? So one of the most famous futurist poems, um, it's eight lines, and each line is just a single sound that eight different people are supposed to repeat over and over and over again. And it's supposed to create like the sound of an electric typewriter. So yeah, so the futurists are fixated on mach like that machine, particularly like human machine hybrids are the future, right? That the more in tune people become with machines, the better. Now the other major early modernist Art movement is called Dada. You're not, and you remember. You know, I know about what Dada. That is, okay. Yeah. So tell us what you know about Dada then. Um. <laughs> well, I did it based on like surrealism, like. Mm -hmm. Surrealism actually grows out of Dada. Yeah. yeah. It's like the. Um, well, I did a project on it, kind of, but it's <laughs> like. Um. I did it by the unconscious mind and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And it's like, um, I don't know a good explanation of it. <laughs> OK, that's, yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll get there. Right? <laughs> yeah. so does anybody know why I, why, why I put this up here, what, what we're looking at? Not quite, but in my head, it's like, Toilet. <laughs> also, a camera. I don't know why. Yeah. No. Yeah. This. Yeah. This is a urinal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So. In 1917, the French artist Marcel Duchamp, who was living in New York, was on a jury for an art show, and this was submitted as a sculpture. To be. Um, exhibited in the show, right? And the other members of the jury said, like, no, who the hell is this arm mutt, right? Like, no, this is ridiculous. This is not art. And Duchamp argued, well, no, actually, art is whatever the hell we say it is, right? Art is a matter of selection, not of creation. 
And so why shouldn't we consider this art? So he voted for it to be included in the show. Now it also turned out that our mud was Marcel Duchamp, right? And he was doing this to play a prank on the other jurors. But that's really kind of what Dada is, right? It's an elaborate prank. Right? Art to the Dadaist is basically a joke. And again, to give you historical context for this, right? Most of the major figures in Dada are wartime exiles. They've seen you know, their homes, their countries, flattened, destroyed by war. And they're operating in a context where it seems like there is no stable center and nothing makes sense anymore. And so Dada is, you know, in part like a, a, a response to the questions like, okay, like, what does the artist do in the face of unprecedented death and destruction? And Dada's response is laugh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I did my project on this guy. Uh -huh. Andre Breton. Yeah, he, yeah he, he's the, the, the founder of, the, of, the, of surrealism in Paris. Yeah, yeah. and he mm -hmm. like, sits in this chair with this piece of paper over his face, and he's supposed to be like a um, machine himself. It's like, yeah, yeah. Really, it's, uh -huh. you're and looking at it like he's so strange. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's like mm -hmm. the idea. Well, and, and, and Breton had been. Um, during the First World War, he had worked as a volunteer nurse mm -hmm. in French army camps. And he had met all of these soldiers who were suffering from these bizarre psychological ailments, right? Mm -hmm. And it got him interested in the therapeutic power of dreams, mm -hmm. which is where surrealism ultimately comes from, right? So Dada is a, you know, is a joke, right? Mm -hmm. Surrealism is based on dream logic and kind of this kind of a associative um, kind of symbolic logic, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where, where Dada goes when it can't go any further, right? But I'm going to show you a picture here of another major Dada figure. So this is the poet Hugo Ball. So Ball was active in Zurich, which was the other major Dada center, um, at a place called the Cabaret Voltaire. And he would dress up in this cardboard costume as, a, as like a kind of bishop. And he would get up on stage while a guy behind him was you know, kind of doing this African drumming. And he would recite these nonsense poems. Like, and I mean nonsense like in a made up language. <laughs> right? It, it's, it's not even a made up language because the, like, the syllables literally don't mean anything. But he would recite it with this seriousness, right? <laughs> and the whole thing is basically a joke about the self-importance of the bourgeois artist, right? It's like, haha, you think you're doing this, you know, important shit, uh, <laughs> when really, you know, all, all you're doing is bloviating to make yourself feel like you're the center of the universe. So, both of the major early continental modernist art movements are essentially kind of nihilistic, right? The only one that posits a real way forward, futurism, believes that the way forward is violent and, you know, like kind of focused on the fusion of man and machine. Now, what Eliot comes up with is actually something quite different. So he kind of shares the basically bleak view of the universe that these other two movements articulate. But he bases his work on something from the pre-war world, or at least he bases this work on something from the pre-war world. What the wasteland is really about, or kind of like what is at the center of the poem,
is these kind of vegetation and fertility myths. That's what forms the basic backbone of what we have here. In particular, a book by a Scottish anthropologist named James George Fraser called The Golden Bow. So have any of you ever heard of The Golden Bow before? All right, I will take your generalized silence and handshake between now. <laughs> Okay, so The Golden Bough is this really kind of revolutionary book around the turn of the 20th century. It's very long <laughs> and very dry. <laughs> but Fraser's basic argument is that modern religions originate in ancient fertility cults, right? Basically that the fertility-based religions of the ancient world evolve and are adapted into uh, modern religions, right? And in particular, what we tend to, what, what he focuses on is what he calls life, death, rebirth myths. So, <clears throat> Fraser is comparing myths across different cultures, um, particularly in the Middle East and Europe. And what he notices is that an awful lot of different mythological traditions um, involve um, a god whose death and rebirth seem to be in some way connected to um, seasonal cycles, right? So, you know, for example, you know, the myth of Balder in Norse mythology, um, you know, the myth of Osiris in Egyptian mythology, um, the myth of um, Tammuz in Babylonian mythology, and, you know, he this was something that had to be excised from the original edition because it was apparently a little too spicy for the early 20th century. But he associates uh, the Christ story with this as well, right? With this general body of life, death, rebirth myth. So, <clears throat> Eliot isn't using Fraser's template directly, right? He's getting it kind of secondhand through the work of a woman by the name of Jessie L. Weston. Who wrote a book called From Ritual to Romance. And what Weston did was apply Fraser's framework to uh, the medieval Grail stories, right? So are any of you familiar with um, the story of the Grail or with what the Grail is? Oh, you like Holy Grail? Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is often referred to as the Holy Grail, yes. Okay. Um, and over time, it doesn't originate this way. But over time, the grail comes to be, you know, associated with the, the cup that Christ used at the Last Supper, right? Um, originally, the grail is a serving dish of mysterious purpose. We never actually know what the grail was supposed to be for, because the guy who was writing the romance about the grail died before he finished it. And grail uh, kind of comes from 
the word grawl, which used to be common in northern Spain and southern France to describe a kind of deep serving dish. So it wasn't originally a cup. But the basic plot of the grail story is you have this figure called the Fisher King, who rules the wasteland. And at some point in the past, the Fisher King has been wounded in the thigh. Now, think about that. What is that probably a euphemism for? Especially if we think about the fact that he is, he rules over an infertile kingdom. Yeah, so wounded in the thigh is a euphemism for castration, right? And the Fisher King, and by extension the land he rules, can only be healed if a knight undertakes the journey to the Chapel Perilous and asks the right questions about the Grail. thus restoring fertility to king and land, right? So I think the big thing that we need to do to understand this poem is to note that it's extremely anxious about fertility and sexuality. Right? <clears throat> That's the big anxiety at the center of this poem, right? So just take a minute and think about like whether there are places in the poem, as you have already read it, that seem to speak to that anxiety. I'll give you an example right here, the, the burial of the dead, the first part. Um, you know, there's the... Uh, the line on page uh, 661, right? I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Right? <clears throat> now, when I first read this poem when I was in high school, right, like, I had no idea what any of this meant. But that line, like I said, I wrote it all over all of my notebooks because it just sounded really metal. <laughs> <laughs> but what does that mean? Like, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. If we're thinking about it in these kind of fertility terms, what does this mean? That you're like losing or producing nothing, maybe? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, dust is like unproductive soil, right? I will show you fear in a handful of dust. So, yeah, that fear is fear of infertility, right? Of not being. Okay, so see if you can come up with any similar passages on your own here. If you, if you need help or have questions, I will, uh, if you need help, I will grant you. If you have questions, I will answer them. Maybe like in the last line, the fire sermon, uh -huh. when it talks about like she's saying, "Well, that's done, and I'm glad it's over." <laughs> like, okay, yeah, yeah. Like the whole passion thing, she's just kind of like over it, and I'm like, yeah. I mean, the the, the typist, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout this um, encounter with the young man Carbuncular, right? Do we know what Carbuncular means? Carbuncular means he has pimples. But yeah, like she's completely passive through the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, what we have here narrated is an essentially pointless, almost mechanical sexual encounter, right? The food that she produces for their meal beforehand is in tins, right? It's just, it comes from cans. There's, it, it's, you know, removed from nature. Um, and there's no effort. 
through yeah, making it. Yeah, 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 the, so yeah, the, everything here is effortless, right? Even the gramophone that she starts at the end of this passage has an automatic hand, right? Everything here is basically mechanical. And yeah, so yeah, what we have here is yeah, an example of a kind of pointless sexual encounter, right? Just pointless, mechanical, no one gets anything from it. And it's narrated by this figure from Greek mythology, Tiresias. Do any of you know anything about Tiresias or who Tiresias was? There's a little bit in the footnote. And there's all this weird shit about him being an old man with wrinkled duds. Yes, okay, so Tiresias on the one hand, like, there are two reasons here why Tiresias is this kind of omniscient figure who can um, narrate this scene. One is that he was a famous seer, right, in Greek mythology. The other is a story in which, yeah, like, Tiresias as a man is walking up a hill comes upon two snakes that are coupling, you know, says stop that and hits him with a stick. <laughs> and is instantly changed into a woman. He then lives several years as a woman, and one day is climbing back up that mountain, sees two snakes coupling again, hits him with a stick and says, hey, stop that. Um, and is changed back into a man. So Tiresias is in this myth, the only human being who knows what it is like to be both a man and a woman. And so he can narrate this scene from both perspectives. But he's just one of many voices that we hear in this poem. Right, so, for example, if you look back to uh, the end of a game of chess, there's this uh, conversation between these two women in a bar, right? So, when Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, hurry up please, it's time. Now Albert's coming back, make yourself a bit smart. You want to know what you've done with that money he gave you and get yourself some teeth? He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lou, and get a nice set. He said, I swear I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said, and think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and give me a straight look. Hurry up, please. It's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique, and her only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She said five already and nearly died a young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please, it's time. So... <clears throat> The conversation here between, between these women, right, about what's happened to Lil. What's going on here? What are they talking about? Are they talking about, so I know they're talking about getting her new pair of teeth. Is that like trying to look nice for him? Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it was actually like, it used to be much, much more common for people, even people who were not very old, to wear dentures, um, in large part just because the state of dentistry was so rudimentary, right? Nowadays, you know, people will 
keep their teeth as long as they can. <laughs> but it was fairly common for people to get all their teeth yanked out and just get dentures. But what, you know, what else is going on here? So apparently Will's husband is getting like sent home from war. Yeah. And that's why <laughs> the other one wants to like, there's a done up. Mm -hmm. She looks really bad, even at a young age. Yeah. Um, also, the woman had an abortion by kids yeah. that, um, mm -hmm. she nearly died giving birth to her fifth child. Uh-huh. And the other one was like berating her for having an abortion. Like, if you got married, you know, what'd you get married for other than have kids? Yeah, and she, she already had five. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah, yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I, I think but like this speaks to a certain level of anxiety as well, right? About the limits of fertility, and in particular, it's like, you know the fact that the pills make Lil look old, right, and unattractive. I think is kind of of a piece with that, right? Now the other thing to note here is you know the various references to death by water. Right, which on the one hand is both the shortest section of the poem, right? Death by water, a little bit about Phlebas the Phoenician. But there is a particular symbolism attached to this. So the first time we see a reference to death by water, right, is in the burial of the dead. Now, when we talk about the burial of the dead, like most of the imagery we see here is of stuff growing out of places where dead, dead things or dead people have been buried, right? The normal cycle of things, as at least as Eliot conceives it. But there's this reference here to the Starnberger Zay, which is a large lake in Germany. And this particular lake is where King Ludwig, II, Ludwig II of Bavaria drowned in um, shit, what was the, 1886. And um, his drowning may not have been an accident. So I don't know if any of you have ever heard of King Ludwig. Have, you, have, have any of you ever heard of Mad Ludwig? You guys had a couple years of pandemic schooling, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> so Ludwig II of Bavaria is often called Mad Ludwig, um, not because um, he was actually like like a violent psychopath. You know, there's there's a theme park in Virginia near Williamsburg called Bush Gardens, um, and you know it's you know the one place in the world where there's an Irish pub that only serves Budweiser. Um, and um, you know you, you've got you, it's all the rides you love about Europe without any of that annoying culture, um, but um, <clears throat> there's one ride. It's like a haunted house ride. It's you know the, like King Ludwig's wild ride or something like that. You know, so you know like Mad Ludwig, you know, lunging out at you and you know turning into a werewolf and shit like that. Um, there's nothing about that in Ludwig the Second story, right? So Ludwig was actually was personally a fairly harmless individual, but he had a passion for building these fairy tale castles. So there are all of these faux medieval castles in Bavaria that are products of the 19th century, right? Now, there were two reasons why several people in Ludwig's court regarded him as a problem. One, uh, his castle building was bankrupting the kingdom. The second is that Ludwig was more or less openly gay and was not likely to produce an heir. And so in order to um, solve the problem of the um, free spending monarch who was not going to produce an heir, um, it is argued that his courtiers had him drowned to get him out of the way. And death by water in the poem is associated particularly 
with infertile sexuality. Sometimes a little bit obliquely. Right. I think it's kind of ironic how they were upset that his castle living was bankrupting the kingdom, but then I'm thinking of Gothic follies, like what they were paying <laughs> to get those built. Which, yeah. Like, a century earlier, yeah, there yeah. were people building all of building all of this ridiculous shit. Yeah, <laughs> I think the difference being is that they were using private funds. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, still a waste of money, but it was at least their own money. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so you know we have this figure of Phlebas the Phoenician sailor. who comes up in the tarot reading along with the one-eyed merchant, right? So they've got these, these figures, the drowned sailor and the one-eyed merchant that correspond to characters that correspond to each other. So Phlebas is the drowned sailor and Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, corresponds to the one-eyed merchant. And they correspond to each other in that they're both Middle Eastern, Mr. Eugenides offers currants, right? So these little things like, like raisins. While well, Phlebas' dead body is caught up in the currants. So we are meant to identify these two figures with each other. And Mr. Eugenides. Fire sermon, um, right? Page six, uh, 666, um, just before the episode we were just talking about with Tiresias. Um, right? In an unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter moon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven, with a pocket full of currants, CIF London, documents at sight, ask me in demotic French to lunch at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. So the Cannon Street Hotel and the Metropole were both uh, well-known gay hangouts. So essentially what Mr. Eugenides is doing here is, going to, is making a homosexual proposition. So <clears throat> this idea of death by water is opposed by Eliot to the burial of the dead, which results in new growth. Now, the other thing that results in new growth seems to be an infusion of energy from someplace else, right? So what did you make of the end of the poem when we have all of this, um, all of these Sanskrit words? Okay. Let's learn another language to understand this poem. <laughs> So we have these three words that are represented by the syllable da. I'm also wondering, like, I, you know, I hadn't thought of this before, I'm also wondering if the da syllable here is connected to da-da in some way as well. But he's taking this story from a set of Hindu philosophical texts called the Upanishads, um, in which the syllable da is spoken, and demons, human beings, and lesser gods all hear something else according to what their nature is, right? So humans hear the word data, which 
which means give, because human beings are naturally selfish. Demons, hear the words diadavam, which means love, because they are naturally cruel. And lesser gods hear the word damyata, which means control, because they're naturally unruly. So in order to achieve salvation, each of these groups, right, humans, demons, and lesser gods, has to act in a way that's not in accordance with their nature, right? In fact, it's kind of the opposite of what their, what their nature is. So there seems to be here at least like something about like not following your natural inclinations. <laughs> Because this is what accompanies, you know, the giant thunderclouds coming from over the Himalayas and bringing rain to the wasteland. And that's about the best I can make out of, of most of this. Like, do, do, is this making more sense to y'all now? Yeah. Okay, can we, <laughs> so we can at least see, like, the logic of this and how things connect to each other. And what the intent is here. Now, there's still a lot of this that is cryptic, right? Like, there's this, on page 671, and I'm just going to bring this up because I don't know what to do with it, but the imagery is really freaking cool. And, like, so, so much of this poem is, you know, I, I know I keep saying this, but so much of this poem is so metal. <laughs> right? A woman drew her long black hair out tight and filled whisper music on those strings. And bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall. And upside down in air were towers, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours, and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. What do you, what do you all think of that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is like a, like horror film imagery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the upside down thing almost connects with that whole the data and di the all the words okay, die, yeah, like yeah, as yeah. in like mm -hmm. it's contrary to what you would normally do. Like you're yeah. not gonna really like let me go upside down to try and like <laughs> get to wherever I'm going. Yeah. I'm also wondering too if like. There's something here to do with um, with battlefields, like with the idea of, of, of like you know place you know, like buildings being torn from their foundations, um, you know the voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. Like that sounds to me a little bit like people in trenches. But yeah, the, the woman the woman drawing her hair out and fiddling whisper music on the string the, on, on the long black strings. That that I have a hard like I can't quite figure out what the hell's going on there. <laughs> it's not, almost sounds like she rips it out of her head. Uh -huh. <laughs> what are you doing? Why? The bats with baby faces and about a light is creepy. Uh -huh. <laughs> God damn with bat the baby face. Uh -huh. It's hard to imagine that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, the way I get this, like, the bats are, you know. Maybe the bats are trying to make an innocence of, like, like, people trying to make innocence out of war, maybe? Like, because babies uh, are, like, the euthanism of. Yeah, okay, for, 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 yeah, for innocence, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and.
and you know, I mean, like, if, if we look at the, the death toll in the First World War, is very disproportionately very young men, right? I'm wondering too if the fact like that it's these bats with baby faces, like it's almost like going against that same idea. Like the whole poem has been kind of about like infertility, and it's almost like at the very end yeah. there might be like in some weird twisted uh -huh. way a slight ray of hope, like. Uh -huh. But, but it's like these weird, awful hybrid creatures, right? Yeah. 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 Almost, almost like the, the kind of the futurist machine monsters, right? Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we're, we're about out of time anyway. But like, honestly, like, like that's the furthest I've ever got with this stanza. <laughs> <laughs> so good on y'all. <laughs> All right. So let me give you some reading questions for next time. And Peyton is going to guide us through uh, Virginia Woolf.